Hello, everybody. Welcome to Lord of Harvest. Um, just want to say a couple things and lead us in prayer. And, uh, and if you go back to Moses where he was off in the desert and the shepherd and he's looking up on the mountain and he sees the flaming bush and says, I'm going to go up there. And he goes up there and he finds God, right? Then if you go forward, because Jesus, or because God told him that he was going to be the shepherd to lead the, the slaves out of Egypt, right? So then if you go forward when they're out there in the wilderness, and then Moses goes back up to the mountain again, and he finds God again. And then that's the Ten Commandments, right? And then if you go all the way forward past that, after Jesus' death on the cross, and after he's in the tomb, Mary goes to prepare the body, and she can't find Jesus, right? He's already gone. We all know later on he reveals himself to him, but initially he couldn't find, or she couldn't find him in there. So for today, that's going to be my prayer, that in all the worship and all the words that are being said here today, that each and every one of us finds Jesus Let him speak to all of us in a, in a special way and, I mean, just reveal what's our life in him. So, Lord, come be with us. Amen. Amen. Okay, at this time, we're going to celebrate um, Holy Communion. So, if you're at home, make sure you get something um, for bread and you get a drink for um, the cup. Okay, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. Um, this is in Corinthians, which you don't have to turn to. And um, it's um, one account of um, sharing the Lord's Supper. And um, it says, let's see, for as long, often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So um, before we even start with... Um, sharing the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood. Um, I just want to think about a few things for myself. I, you know, I knew I was going to talk today, and man, a whole lot of things went through my mind up until, you know, the last 10 minutes. And um, one of the things that I want to mention before I even go into the main thing that I'm going to say, and hopefully this is going to be pretty short, um, is, you know, during the celebration of praising God's name, we call it the worship portion, but really I'm worshiping right now. And we're worshiping when um, Pastor Janine gets up and she starts preaching. It's all worship. Yes. Um, but the Lord was um, kind of speaking to me, and um, this is an odd thing to, I guess, come to my mind during that time, but um, I'm, my vocation is an artist. And, um, you know, I have a number of artist friends, and one of the things we talk about, and this sounds really weird, but I couldn't afford myself. 
you know, I, if I wanted to buy my work, I, I wouldn't buy it because I couldn't afford it, but I can make it. And um, so sometimes I tell myself, oh, okay, so that's why I'm an artist, so that I can have beautiful things around me, which I can't afford. But, um, you know, um, as believers, we all have the ability to create beautiful things, whether it's through painting, whether it's through serving, whether it's through um, sharing, in whatever way possible. Um, I mean, there's so many ways, I can't name them all. But we all have that ability to create something beautiful and surround ourselves with beautiful things. And um, that's something we have to choose to do. Um, communion is about community. And, and it's about communication. And as we're doing this right now, people all over the world are also sharing communion, yes. the Holy Communion of Jesus Christ, which, um, let me see if I can find this very quickly. When, um, let's see. Jesus said, this is in Luke. Don't bother turning there either. I'll just read it. This is from the um, New American Standard. And um, it says, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles or the disciples were with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And it has been fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And Jesus was excited to, you know, that was a Passover celebration. He was excited to eat that with his, his disciples or apostles because um, it means everything. You know, there was, um, there's a idiom that says you are what you eat and um you know we are what we eat and it was thought of as a nutritional thing you know i can I, I looked it up and i guess it, in the 1800s it started and then the hippies revived it um which i don't understand that because how could you you know casually take drugs and then worry about eating the right foods but anyways um we are what we eat, and we should be consuming every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We should be consuming it, and um, not only while we're reading the word, while we're with believers in the congregation, but in our daily lives. We should see him everywhere. We should see him in every way. We should be able to look for him in, um, in our daily life. You know, God can use any donkey anywhere to, to do his will and to say his words. And that could be me right now. It could be anybody. And so even non-believers who we think they have nothing, God can use them as well. And God can use them to spurn us on. And communion, and, and, and even other believers, you know, we can be the donkey. But, um, and I'm not saying that in a flattering way either, but it's, a, it's all about God. It's not really about us. But um, it is about communication. And one of the things we've been talking about a lot lately is communication within the body of Christ and how there's so much division, so much striving we're all different we are all very different and one of the things about looking at the account of the lord's supper is that while jesus was going through this holy beautiful communion communication with his apostles there was someone in the room who was at the same time betraying him and you know i i hope this isn't confusing to anybody what i'm saying but I don't want to be that person who um, is betraying, betraying Christ 
by not seeing Jesus in my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And so, um, you know, as we read at the beginning, we have to eat and drink in a worthy manner. So my prayer is, dear Jesus, reveal our hearts to our minds and to our spirit, Lord God, so that we, we can repent of any and every problem we have with your church, Lord God, with your people. It's not about one person, it's about everybody. Lord, we believe in the communion of saints before us, after us, during our time, Lord God, around the world right now sharing communion. And Lord, there are differences, but we are not the judge. We are not the enforcer. We are not the ones to go out and make or force anyone to do things right, which we may think is our way. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but we are not the judge and enforcer, Lord. You are the only judge in that regard, Lord God. We're not, we're not the Bible police. We're not, we're not the church police, Lord God. We're not the, the church militia, Lord God. We are your people, Lord God. Teach us to love one another. Lord, we know that it's through our love that the world sees you, Lord God, so we need more love. Lord, I pray that you forgive every one of us who has ought against his brother or sister because of a difference of opinion, Lord God. I pray that we can love each other into the kingdom of God being a, a place of holy communion. Lord God, we want holy communion, Lord God, not profane communion, not um, an communion taken in an unworthy manner, Lord God, where we we um, eat and drink judgment unto ourselves. We do not want that, Lord God. So I pray that you reveal to us right now, Lord God, I repent for anything, Lord God, that has caused me in my heart to um, say an evil word against someone, to think an evil thought against someone, to judge someone, Lord God, for um, what they've done. If I'm in the wrong or if they're in the wrong, Lord, you will judge us, Lord God, and I pray that you will set us straight through your mouth, Lord God, through, through your blessings, Lord God. I just ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that we would be the people that create beauty around ourselves because, Lord God, we want to be surrounded by beauty, and it all comes from you, Lord God. So give us the ability to use those things that you've given us, Lord, our our spiritual gifts, our earthly gifts, Lord God, the things we were born with and the things we've developed, Lord, that we might use those things to create beauty in this world, Lord God. In this world, yes, Lord, in this world. This is where we are right now. Our feet are on the ground. Let us create beauty around us in this world through whatever it is that you've given us to use, Lord. We all have that capability. Even if we're bedridden, Lord God, we can pray and create beauty around us, Lord God. So awaken that in every heart today, Lord God, as we, we consume your body, Lord, when we become one together, Lord, eating the same loaf, Lord God, we're all becoming one. We all have that... Um, nutrition in us, Lord, that comes from you. Yeah. You did it, Lord God. Yeah. It's all you, Lord. So, Lord, we take, we take the bread right now. Thank you, Jesus. And, Lord, we consume your blood, Lord God. We're like a giant vine coming from you, Lord God. And so, Lord, we ask that you would make us one through this. You said, do it in remembrance of me. We do it in remembrance of you, Lord God. 
who wanted to see a spotless and blameless church, Lord God. So we ask that you would do this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to your name. We welcome you out there in Zoom land, not Zoo land, Zoom land, and we, we ask that the Lord would bless you with his spirit today because all we need is Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. You know, you can study all you want, all the commentaries, and really, you know, pray about everything, but if you don't have the spirit, which that spirit is the love of God and the love of the Father, then, then it's all clanging symbols. It's, it's, it's really worthless. So today, I pray, Lord, come. We welcome your Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord God, that today, not only would we read your word, but that your word would read us that you would minister to us, Lord, that you would point out by your spirit the areas where you want us to be free. Amen. Well, to begin with, um, I'm going to be speaking about the story of Jonah. And the story of Jonah is famous for being a children's Bible story. But it is not merely just that. So that is where... Um, I am going to go today in the book of Jonah. If you want to turn there, go ahead. Well, you can kind of skip around with me. But that's where we're going to uh, move out of. Um, the Pre- Presbytery of Philadelphia said this. This story, the story of Jonah, reminds us of the intensity of our human resistance when it comes up against God's grace for those that we do not like or love or our enemies. Amen? Our human resistance is intense. And we can justify those thoughts and opinions easily, can't we? The Lord said to love our enemies, to do good to those who persecute us. So, In the book of Jonah, this takes place in the city of Nineveh, an Assyrian city. And um, these were not Jonah's people. And the belly of the great fish, we all know that part, is a dark place of resistance, of self-righteousness, where our assumptions are challenged by the Holy Spirit of God and the teachings of Jesus. Who are your contemporary Ninevites? Who are those people to you? Are they foreigners, Muslims, atheists, rich or poor people, fat people, successful people, smart people, ignorant people, people of color, um, unbelievers? Are they Democrats? Are they Republicans? Are they Socialists? Are they ISIS? And on and on. There are all, in, in every one of us, there, there are things that we, by virtue of being human, have bias. And our life experiences, our ethnicities, our socioeconomic backgrounds, our successes and our failures, help us to grow up with a set of bias, right? But the word of God wants to set us free from those strongholds. Do you know, if you have a stronghold in your mind or in your emotions or in your soul in any way, it is virtually impossible to penetrate and to get entrance unless it is the spirit of God. So. Outside of Christ, we cannot be free from those things. But in Christ, we can. And he comes to us repeatedly through our lives to set us free. Amen? 
Um, may the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us today, deliver us today, as we welcome gladly his words, his loving correction, his healing and deliverance for anything, any belief, any bias, any sin that opposes his truth. We oppose his truth like Jonah in small ways and sometimes big ways. So before we begin with this story, I want to share one of my favorite verses in this book, and it's chapter 2, verse 8. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy and their own grace. How many times have we been addressed about the idolatry in our lives? And we justify those things or we just don't go there. We don't want to forfeit God's mercy, right? We want to let go of those things that are worthless that actually in idolatry become greater to us that we cling to other than God. And see, we learn um, behavior patterns to survive in our life. But at some point or another, we have to address those areas in us where the word of God wants to dwell, the spirit of God, the holiness of God. So, Lord, may your spirit reveal any idolatry, any sin, anything that opposes you in any way today. By the way, this scripture, the one that I just read, is a dire warning to the church and especially the so-called prophets of our day who cling to worthless idols. And what does that mean? Those who mix their passion and their opinions and declare it to be God speaking. You can have an opinion. You can have a passion. But if you put God's name on it, woe if it is not God. The gift of prophecy, when it moves, moves through human beings. It moves through the personality and the soul of the, the person declaring it. So it is imperfect in a lot of ways. The closer we are to Jesus, the purer the word of truth of prophecy comes forth. And so many have traded their allegiance from the kingdom of God and the word of God to their per political persuasions, their religious persuasions, their unreligious persuasions, so on and so forth. And so, Lord, deal with that, we pray. I know here at Lord of the Harvest, we, we hammer this quite often, and, um, and, and it's, it's a really good thing, it's very freeing, but um, sometimes we have to remember that we are called to love those that are in a different opinion than we ourselves, right? Um, peacemaking is a blessing. And it takes some work. Making peace takes some work. It means listening, understanding, sometimes keeping your mouth shut, and sometimes opening your mouth. Here are some of the red flags of uh, an imperfect human being working through so-called prophecy. It's dangerous to do so. They are proud, critical, fault-finding, and divisive. And may I say that God Almighty hates division. So let's go to Jonah 1.1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, and that man, his father, his name literally meant loyal and truthful. And Jonah was parented by truthfulness, loyalty, and his name, the son, Jonah, means dove. And the image of a dove brings about a lot of different images of purity, of peace, of holiness. 
of the fruit of the Spirit. And we'll see in the story that Jonah had yet to grow up into his name, right? So um, let me just say, did you know that a dove will not retaliate even when they're attacked, but they will cry in distress? That's amazing. So when we are attacked, when we have retaliation, even from our brothers and sisters, we should not attack back. But we have the ability to cry in our distress, which really alludes to the power of intercession and prayer. So we must be wise as serpents, as Jesus said, and gentle as doves. We see quickly in this story, if you, and most of you are familiar with it, that the story has more to do with the prophet's character than the actual one-line prophecy. And the one-line prophecy, as we'll see later on in the story, is yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was the word that is recorded in the scripture, one line. And let me give you a little background of Nineveh. Assyria and Nineveh was the most hated in their time. They were beautifully adorned. It was a real metropolitan type um, city. It was known, and they were known for their cruelty, their violence, their savagery. They would burn boys and girls alive. They would take adults and skin them alive and leave them out in the hot sun to die. And they not only did these cruel, savage acts, but they celebrated it. Now, I don't know about you, but I know there's nothing new under the sun, and sometimes they complain about where the world is now, but when I look here, I think there is nothing new under the sun. This, this is the way of the world. Amen. So Jonah, in verse 3, um, flees from the presence of the Lord, right? And he goes to Joppa. Now, remember, Jonah's being called to unbelievers, enemies. And just like he fled here, we see in Acts chapter 10, Joppa was where Peter received the vision of the clean and the unclean. And this was a real stretch to the mindset of the Hebrews of that day because any other people group was considered an enemy. They were God's chosen people. So Jonah gets his ticket, he buys his fare, and he heads for Tarshish. He flees from God and he goes as far away west as God had called him east to Nineveh. That's what he did. Now remember, Jonah was a patriot. Jonah was a Hebrew national. Congratulations, Jonah. You have a hot dog named after you. <laughs> Not only was Jonah afraid, I mean, I would be afraid being called to this group. We all would be. But his problem, basically, the root matter was that his hatred far exceeded his love for God. So you can see how he would justify his disobedience. In his pride, he was blind to his own self-righteousness. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Nowhere can it be found in that day in a Jewish sensibility that this was God. It, it, it was very foreign, foreign, foreign to even think in those terms. But how many of you know God came for the world, for the Gentiles, for the whole world, and not just a specific people group, not taking anything away from that, but God came for the world. So Jonah, like many of our prophetic people today, determined Nineveh's unworthiness. 
They were un unworthy in his mind to receive salvation, grace, but worthy of wrath and judgment. Beware. False prophecy that has discernment about cruelty or whatever without vision of redemption is dangerous. God hates it. And that's what unjustly divides people from one another. So in contrast to the kingdom, unity brings the anointing to break the heavy divisive yokes, bringing harmony, peace, and brotherly love in Jesus Christ. Lord, hear our doves cry for unity in this hour. Hear, O oh Lord, and forgive us. So again, Jonah pays his fare. This is in, in verse 3. He gets on board with, ironically, unbelieving heathen, sailors, mariners. I think that's ironic. He was called to go to them, and here he is on a ship with them. Ask yourself, where do you go when you flee from the presence and the power of God? What is your proverbial Tarshish? Uh, maybe it's TV, computers, food, etc., etc. Relationships, I need a man in my life, I'm single. I need a woman in my life, I'm single, I'd rather do that than serve God. It's happened so many times, can't even count it. So in verse four, we see that the Lord sent the great wind. The Lord sent the storm. Be careful when you blame everything on the devil, right? The Lord sent the um, storm, and it was so severe, grown men, weathered, sailors began to cry. Hmm. So, as the story goes, um, Jonah gets busted by the sailors when he, they find out their prayers to their God, by the way, was Dagon, half fish, half man. We'll get to that maybe a little bit later. But um, remember, it will cost you something to flee from the presence of the Lord. It will cost you more than you know. So here's these grown men in the story in the sea, which represents the Gentile world, as I said, and, the, and they believe that they were uh, their life came from the sea, they, that they were birthed out of the sea. But when they confronted Jonah after seeking their own relief from their God, they understood that the Hebrew God was more powerful than Dagon, their God. So he gets busted. In verse 8, um, they uh, ask him, uh, why? Why is this storm happening? And Jonah confesses. When you're in the midst of unbelievers, they may ask you questions and you may have to fess up. You may be trying to hide a little bit by fitting in, partying just a little bit, or whatever it may be. Um, just whatever it may be. So Jonah confesses. What, what is your occupation, Jonah? I'm a prophet. What is the country that you come from? Israel. Who are your people? Hebrews. Uh, how do we fix this, Jonah? Throw me over, Jonah says. So it not only cost Jonah, but these men had cargo that they threw overboard as well, and it cost them their livelihood. So it's very likely that these sailors, these mariners, spread the news of Jonah's God, that they were converted, actually. And their, their testimony of what happened probably preceded Jonah before he came with the one-line prophecy. So they were converted. Now let's look at chapter 2. And I'm going to read, you will be surprised to hear this psalm of repentance 
that is directly from the Psalms that coincides with the Psalm of Repentance by Jonah. Chapter 2, verse 2. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before his ears. You laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. I have come into deep waters where the floods overthrow me. You have kept me alive that I should not go into the pit. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is distressed. I have hated those who regard useless idols, but I trust in the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. You, your blessing is on your people that I may proclaim in the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. This is Psalm 18.6, Psalm 33b, Psalm 134, verse 4, Psalm 2.8, Psalm 26.7, and Psalm 116, verses 17 and 18. Doesn't it surprise you that it's almost verbatim when you read Jonah's Psalm of Repentance? I think that's just amazing. So, Jonah is... Uh, the Lord prepares the fish for Jonah. The Lord sent the storm, the Lord prepared the fish, the great fish, and it's known scientifically that there are uh, certain uh, great fish that have compartments of air that can, they can swallow up to eight feet and that there are compartments of air so you actually could live and uh, survive. And you know, who knows if that great fish, we say it's a whale, but who knows if it's in, uh, what do you call it? Distinct? Indistinct? Gone? Forever? Extinct. Extinct. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Okay, so um, here's Jonah. He, this is his psalm when he was in the belly of the whale, that dark place of resistance. And I, I imagine he started praying the minute he hit that mouth, right? And um, when he came out, he didn't look like how he went in, right? <laughs> he didn't smell like he did when he went in. In fact, probably the very acid of that great fish really burned or hurt his skin. And so he probably wasn't real um, good looking at that point either. <laughs> so the Lord sent the word again to Jonah in chapter um, 2, verse 10. The Lord spoke to the fish and he was vomited out. And then chapter 3. In verse 2, the Lord came to him a second time, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So, you know, God doesn't give up on us, right? Amen. Even prophets, if you're out there and you're a prophetic and you've been, you've been wrong, just admit it. You can be right with God in a moment. Mm -hmm. Repent for your false prophecy. So um, here we, we see even still that Jonah is still not where he needs to be, but we don't know the end of the story. We don't know. I, I totally believe that when everything is said and done, he was really grown into the name Dove and under the leadership of truthful and loyal to God. So anyways, uh, Jonah speaks and preaches the word in verse 4, 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now like I said, I, I think that the mariners probably went ahead of him. There are unbelievers witnessing about the Lord God before Jonah even got there. I believe that. And so Jonah says the one word. Look, that one word became a appeal of the Holy Ghost to the people of Nineveh, a revelation of 
the hope that is in the mercy and grace of God. It's the only thing that could have made a king and an entire city repent in sackcloth and ashes, fasting and so on. So um, that's what happened. They really did repent. But in chapter 4, we see that Jonah was exceedingly displeased and angry. Nobody likes to be wrong. Come on now. Jonah's humiliated. He is sullen. He's full of self-pity. He looks like a false prophet because he said something different and the people responded. And his reputation is tarnished. Prophets, I'm talking to you. Jonah, like us, held God, almighty God, the creator of the universe, the king of glory, in contempt. Pretty heavy. Contempt is, you're beneath my consideration. You're deserving God of scorn, disrespect, disdain. It's a pattern of attitude and behavior. Lord, I know better than you. Nothing's worked out the way that I planned. Why is this happening in my life? What is going on? All of those questions. How many people have come to Christ and left him because they held God in contempt? He did not do what they thought he would and should do. Bye. Come back. You can, right? You can come back. It only takes getting on your knees and humbling yourself, setting aside the idolatry of your pride, your self-righteousness, and so on. So, like Jonah, the inner workings and virtue of Christ of God Almighty was yet formed in him fully. <sighs> Is Jesus, do you think, unaware of your wounds, of your pain, of your unforgiveness and your bitterness, of your anger, your pride, your fear, your self-pity? No. He is not a God who is unaware. Hebrews 4.15 said he, he has experienced everything that we have experienced. So, God sent the storm. God prepared the fish. God prepared the fish to spit and vomit Jonah out. God gave him a second chance, and then God provided the plant or the gourd and the wind and the sun and so on and so forth. And so Jonah, he made his little habitation up on the hill, so just in case. He was a little far from the judgment and wrath of God, right? And he, and he could, it really is an image of watching God from a distance. How many, how many of us have done that? I'm just going to go back here for a little while and watch God from a distance because I don't want to be in the line of fire. Okay, now I am pretty much done there. I just want to sum up a couple things. Ironically, you know, in the scripture, Dagon, that, that idol, was with the ark and the next day, they found Dagon flattened out, bowing before the ark of the Lord's presence. That fish god that was a symbol for the mariners and the sailors of the day became the very Christian symbol during persecution. So speak about redemption. I think that's so cool. I'll show that Dagon. That's what God said. And during the persecutions that transpired later on, um, believers, how they would identify with each other was with the symbol of the fish. The first believer would, would draw an ark in the dirt, and an unbeliever wouldn't know what that is. 
But a believer would come and draw the ark underneath, that symbol of the fish, and then they would bear witness that they belong to the Lord. And you know, it, it's just, God is so incredibly amazing in all the eensy, beansiest details of life. Everything. It's just, to me, just amazing. He calls his disciples fishers of men. Well, the mariners were fishers, fishermen, but not fishers of men, right? So, really, to, to just sum things up, God's generous grace is way greater than our limited capacity and our limited hearts. Let's pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I just pray the sweeping of your Holy Ghost here today, here and out there, online. And I pray, Lord, that you would show your searchlight on all the places we flee from your presence, the places that we've locked up, hidden away from you, and don't want you to touch, Lord God. Lord, we know. We know that your grace is generous and rich. Lord, we know your steadfast love and that we are called your people. Father, deal with our prejudice, our bias, the strongholds in our minds and in our hearts, Lord God. Bring us into alignment with the kingdom of God, the word of God, in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen.